When you think of someone who is loyal and trustworthy and committed, who comes to your mind? I'm glad you're here for this conversation today. Hi, I'm Rob, and it's great to be able to catch up with you for a few moments here today. Let me mention our interactive teaching videos that are available for kids and families. A simple search for Cabin Kids on Facebook will take you right to that page and to that resource. Our focus here in these videos is directly related to the themes and scriptures of our family videos we just mentioned, and it's our goal to equip people of all ages for faith conversations in their homes and with other adults as we follow Jesus together. And we continue to demand good character from people in our lives. And we know that character matters because it creates a ripple effect in all of our relationships and connections. And we can be good at judging the character of others, but how does our character need to continue to grow and mature and how do we recognize it? And we're made in God's image and Jesus shows us the best way to be human. And if we allow Jesus to work in us, well, that character development and growth will point others to him. And it has a huge ripple effect in the places we find ourselves. So let's jump in to what we can discover today. Imagine for just a minute you've got to deal with hostility and confusion within your family. And this kind of pull back and forth of people wanting you to choose sides. Or that you've had a good friend and they could end up taking something that is significantly valuable from you. How do you respond? Maybe you made a promise, but that was then and this is now. The promise, it could still be a good thing, but you're not sure you're really ready to follow through on it anymore. And who would know if you just didn't. You know, we face situations like this and even more. And we all want to be people that someone can count on, people who are loyal and trustworthy, people who are committed or even engaged in life. But when the moment comes that we have a choice to make and it's difficult or inconvenient, what does our response look like? David and Jonathan are a neat example of faithfulness. We typically think of them in terms of friendship, but they have a complicated friendship to say the least, and there were a number of promises that they kept with each other and beyond that are interesting for us to explore. Now, Jonathan was the firstborn son of the king, and he was in line for the throne of Israel, and David had been anointed king by God through Samuel, by all accounts, they should have been rivals looking for ways to eliminate each other. That's actually the way Jonathan's father Saul approached it. David is a threat to be removed to preserve the royal line of the kingdom, typical with the culture of the day. But even though Jonathan knew this, he actually helped David again and again and again. He pledged loyalty to David, even if it cost him opportunities in the future. Think about that kind of loyalty for just a minute. Now, there are multiple accounts of this kind of behavior, both from David and from Jonathan. And we're going to look at an example in 1 Samuel chapter 18, and it flows all the way through chapter 20. We're going to read some selected passages out of that whole section. This unlikely friendship starts just immediately after the death of Goliath, so here's what's about to happen in this next chapter in chapter 18, verse 1. It says, after David had finished talking with Saul, which refers to what just happened with the death of Goliath, Jonathan then became one in spirit with David, and he loved David as he loved himself. From that day forward, Saul kept David with him and didn't let him return to his own family. And Jonathan made a covenant with David because he loved him as he loved himself. Jonathan took off the robe he was wearing and gave it to David, along with his tunic, and even his sword, his bow, and his belt. 
Now, this was a significant act of loyalty. To a prince, all of these clothing items and all of these other items were custom made. They were unique to that individual. And for him to give that to a shepherd, well, that made David immediately recognizable as someone who was under the cover or under the care of the prince. David really stood out because whenever he wore these clothing items of Jonathan, people knew that he was good friends with the prince. This was significant and even a little bit ironic that he was wearing the clothes of the one who was next in line to the throne. Now Saul becomes increasingly jealous of David and with his success, with his favor with the people, and I'd encourage you to read on in chapter 18 and see how Saul starts to put David in compromising situations where it gets him maybe injured or killed, but David keeps kind of skating off, doing fine with all of these different situations. Saul even takes matters into his own hands at one point and tries to strike out to eliminate him. And sometime later, as we jump forward into chapter 20, we see this in verse 1. David fled from Naoth at Ramah and went to Jonathan and asked, What have I done? What is my crime? How have I wronged your father that he's trying to kill me? Jonathan says, Never. You're not going to die. Look, my father doesn't do anything, great or small, without letting me know. Why would he hide this from me? It isn't so. But David took an oath and said, Your father knows very well that I have found favor in your eyes. And he said to himself, Jonathan must not know this or he will be grieved. Yet as surely as the Lord lives and as you live, there is only a step between me and death. Jonathan said to David in verse 4, Whatever you want me to do, I'll do for you. So next they hatch a plan and trying to figure out what Saul is thinking about David. So if Saul does this, then our response is for David to be able to stay. If Saul does the other, then, well, David, you should get out of Dodge. So they sort out what their signal is going to be. Arrows in a field, if they go short, stay. If they go long, run. So the whole thing plays out. Saul is clearly still on a rage mode. And so the signal is sent to run. And just before David hits the road, in verse 42 of chapter 20, Jonathan said to David, Go in peace. We have sworn friendship with each other in the name of the Lord, saying, The Lord is my witness between you and me and between your descendants and my descendants forever. Then David left and Jonathan went back to the town. Now despite the fact that David would take the throne from Jonathan, Jonathan kept his word that he would continue to care for David with a loyalty that was incredibly honorable. It must have been hard sometimes to have the thought kind of breeze through your mind, I'm helping the guy that's going to take what belongs to me. But it's a really cool picture of what it means to be true to your word, even when it gets complicated. Fast forward a number of years later, and we see David also following through on a promise he made to Jonathan, a promise that nobody else but Jonathan actually heard, one that he could have completely reneged on or just Omit it. But at this point, David is a king and Saul's descendants really are outcasts in the ethic of the day. They would have been targets to be eliminated because they could have risen up in a rebellion against the current king. So turn ahead to 2 Samuel chapter 9. And David shows another picture of what it means to be loyal and true to your word even when it's complicated. David asked, is there anyone still left in the house of Saul to whom I can show kindness for Jonathan's sake? Now there was a servant of Saul's household named Ziba. They summoned him to appear before David and the king asked him, are you Ziba at your service? He replied, the king asked, is there no one still alive from the house of Saul to whom I can show God's kindness? 
Ziba answered the king, There is still a son of Jonathan. He is lame in both feet. Where is he? the king asked. Ziba answered, He is the ho- at the house of Makir, the son of Amiel, in Lo-Debar. So King David had him brought from Lo-Debar, from the house of Makir, son of Amiel. When Mephibosheth, son of Jonathan, the son of Saul, came to David, he bowed down to pay him honor. He's probably terrified. David said, Mephibosheth, at your service, he replied. Don't be afraid, David said to him, for I will surely show you kindness for the sake of your father, Jonathan. I will restore to you the land that belonged to your grandfather, Saul, and you will always eat at my table. Mephibosheth acknowledges how rare this kind attention is to an heir of a deposed king. And so he bowed down and asked, What is your servant that you should notice a dead dog like me? But David goes even further than just extending safety and kindness to Mephibosheth and his family. The king summoned Ziba, Saul's steward, and said to him, I have given your master's grandson everything that belonged to Saul and to his family. You and your sons and your servants are to farm the land for him and bring in the crops so that your master's grandson may be provided for. And Mephibosheth, grandson of your master, will always eat at my table. Now Ziba, that servant, had 15 sons and 20 servants of his own. Then Ziba said to the king, your servant will do whatever my lord the king commands his servant to do. So Mephibosheth ate at David's table just like one of the king's sons. Mephibosheth had a young son named Micah, and all the members of Ziba's household were servants to Mephibosheth and his family. And Mephibosheth lived in Jerusalem because he always ate at the king's table, and he was lame in both feet. Now, if you're familiar with the account of the lives of David and Jonathan, it's pretty easy for us to overlook just how difficult it would have been for them to keep these promises they've made to each other, from the help given by Jonathan to the courtesies of David directed at Mephibosheth. Like I said, these were completely against the habits and culture of the day. And these guys are such a tremendous example of loyalty and trustworthiness and engaged commitment. And it's valuable because we get a chance to see what faithful looks like in daily life. The kind of faithfulness that God builds in our lives, that follow-through that takes care of business even when it's tough or inconvenient. And we all know we want this from people in our relationships. Nobody signs up for a 75% faithful marriage. You know, if things get difficult, maybe there's options, right? We don't sign up for that. Nobody signs up for banking that says, we'll make your money available at random times and we're not really going to let you know when. And even then, it's not going to be all of it. No thanks. I mean, we don't even want something like we kind of saw here recently in Canada when the internet and phone service just recently went out with one of the carriers and providers. And if their commitment was, we'll make internet and phone service available whenever we feel like it, we'll just kind of keep you guessing, well, you'd have a hard pass. You'd say, no way I'm signing up for that. Now, in all of these cases, We want those people to be people we can count on, or those organizations. They need to be good guardians of our trust. And one author defined faithfulness just like this. True to your word. A concise, clear definition of what it means to be a faithful person. There's consistency in what you say and what you do. True to your word between what you believe and what you behave, true to your word, between what you promise and how you perform, true to your word. Now, we see in Scripture how God is faithful, that he is true to his word. It doesn't mean everybody always loves the way things happen, but we can trust him. He is loyal, 
and trustworthy and engaged and committed with us. And that's what he asks of us toward him and toward others and even toward ourselves. You know, there's an old saying that is a part of life. It says, more is caught than is taught. It's been sometimes referred to as the Achu principle. And maybe you've heard of it. I became very aware of this in people with whom I've spent significant time. I've watched their habits, their actions, sometimes even their attitudes. Phrases that they use are showing up in my own life. Now we understand this on some level. We would maybe say it like your reflection of the company that you keep. And we may ask people, where did you learn that word? Or where did that habit come from? Or how did that attitude get changed in your life? Sometimes these questions are because we see healthy things growing. Other times it's because we see spiraling destructive behavior. But as I said, I saw this link in my own actions more and more. As I realized, did I just say that? That was something my dad always used to say. Or, you know what, the person that I apprenticed with used to approach things this way, and I just did. Isn't that funny? Huh. Or there's times when I go, wow, you know, that is exactly the way my best friend would have approached that situation. Because the volume of time that we spend together leads to us changing our behavior. I reflect the company that I keep. So when we think about faithfulness, we have this built-in yearning and desire to be more faithful. But for faithfulness to grow to fullness, we have to realize that ultimately we need to let God's character grow and surge in us. Some of those simple things like spending time together with him can lead to a change in our behavior because we reflect the company we keep. More is caught than taught. And oftentimes when we hear something like this, we may kind of come at it like, God, just make me faithful. Go ahead and zap me. Make me more like you. But instead, he extends a hand and says, walk with me as my apprentice, and I'll show you how to be faithful. Watch what I do. Let me walk with you as you experience life, and you'll continue to observe how your responses to life change. It may even surprise you to see how your life changes, because as you're walking with God and you start to respond to the work of his hand in your life, you reflect the company that you keep. Now, not everyone will love what that means, but they will know that you are a person who is true to your word. They can count on you. So as his Holy Spirit works in you from the inside out, growing our loyalty to him, to others, and even to ourselves, growing trust, keeping promises, being someone God and people can count on, and even keeping promises that you make to yourself. Growing in engagement or willing involvement with him and with others. More and more, you will reflect the company that you keep. So then as we think about moments like David and Jonathan and what they encountered in this account we read earlier, like when there's hostility and confusion within your family and they're looking for you to choose a side, It could be costly if you don't, or if you do. How do you deal with that political game? Or someone who has been a good friend and looks like they could take something from you. Will we continue to be trustworthy? Can we be counted on to be honest and to look out for their best, even if we suspect them? Who does that anyway? Where does that kind of a response even come from? Sounds a bit like Jesus who was looking out for us, even though it cost him. Or if time passes, and if maybe you could just ignore that promise that you made. That was then. This is now. Other people may have forgotten, but we won't forget, will we? So will we stay silent, or will we follow through on the promises that we've made? We face these situations all the time. And on an increasing basis, 
when faithfulness becomes inconvenient, we reflect the company that we keep. So in the moment of choice, what does our current reflection look like? We all desire to be people that can be counted on, loyal, trustworthy, engaged and committed to people and life. But when the moment of decision arrives, we need to recognize that our growing faithfulness and response, boy, it starts with God, doesn't it? Because in those moments, we will reflect the company that we keep. Let's pray together. Jesus, we thank you for the fact that you are the ultimate example of faithfulness. You extend yourself to us in some of the most inconvenient and uncomfortable situations, and you are true to your word. And so you ask us to be true to our word with you, with others, and even with ourselves. God, there's a lot of times we give ourselves kind of an out. We say, well, maybe the situation's changed or something's different or something has arisen that has just changed the game entirely. God, you've asked us to be people who are faithful in the way that you're faithful to us. And so we ask that as we walk with you, that you would build that faithfulness in us. And for those who are ready to give you permission to follow through in that way, today I pray that you would encourage them and continue to allow them to see your faithfulness growing in their lives. Because we will reflect the company that we keep and we long to reflect your faithfulness in our lives today. In your name I pray. Amen. Thanks again for taking just a few minutes to share this time together with us today. Before you go, if you don't mind taking just a moment to like, comment, or share this video, it's always an encouragement for us when you do. If you haven't subscribed to our YouTube channel, or if you're checking us out on Facebook, then feel free to like or follow us in that setting so that you can stay connected to future posts in either of those venues. In the description box of this video, in both YouTube and Facebook, there is a link to our website that provides extra resources, worship at home resources, as well as some resources to be able to challenge your discussion time with a friend or even consider how you might journal related to what you've heard today. Some other links to our church are all available there and I'd encourage you to check that out as this video concludes. As always, we're praying for you. We trust you're praying for us too. We look forward to seeing you all again soon.